Hi, this is Mrs. Brown from Research Triangle High School. The purpose of this presentation is to give you a brief introduction and overview to the play and the movie Driving Miss Daisy. Now, first of all, now, first of all, let's talk a little bit about the playwright. Alfred Urey was born in Atlanta, Georgia, and that's where this particular play is set. So he's really writing about things that he knew and experienced as he was growing up. This won the Pulitzer Prize for Drama in 1988, which is a writing prize that's given out. But it was based on the real-life relationship between his grandmother and her chauffeur. The play was made into a movie in 89, and Urey himself wrote the screenplay. And then the screenplay won an Oscar for the best adaptation for another medium. So this guy's got some pretty good writing strengths here. Uri's also the author of another screenplays and um, several other things, including Mystic Pizza, which you might know, and uh, Rich in Love. Now, as we mentioned before, the play was originally staged with just two people on the stage, and it, then it was made into a film after that. Now, this film won just about everything you could possibly think of. It won Best Picture, it won Best Actress, it won Best Actor, and tons more. It was nominated for Best Actor uh, with, for Morgan Freeman, and it won a whole bunch of things for art direction and a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, Alfred Urey himself, as I mentioned, wrote the screenplay, so you know that the movie is a faithful adaptation of the original story. And it tells, again, this story of this 25-year relationship between this wealthy elderly Jewish woman who's living in the Deep South in Atlanta, Georgia and her uneducated African-American chauffeur. Now the stage version of the play has only two main characters and then one other character that just appears a little bit. Um, and so we're going to break these down just a little bit as we go. The first lead character and the Daisy of the title, Driving Miss Daisy, is Daisy Worthen. Now she's a retired school teacher and when the play begins she's 72 years old. So when the play starts she's already kind of an old lady. And by the end of the play she's 97. So as the play opens she's just confronting the fact that some of you may have seen with your own grandparents, which is that she really really shouldn't be driving a car anymore. She just doesn't have the reflexes and it's unsafe. She's had an accident and her son said, that's it, mom, you're not driving anymore. We're going to get you a chauffeur. And she's going to have to rely on the chauffeur for all of her transportation. Her son, Bully, is 40 when the play starts, and he's a very successful businessman. He's taken over his father's business in Atlanta, and it's a, a paper factory or something, but he supervises the whole operation. And he's the one who insists that his mom go ahead and get a driver. By the end of the play, he's also 65, so he's nearly as old as his mom is at the beginning of the play. Now, he and his mom are both white, but they're Jewish and upper uh, wealthy, upper middle class. Now, the fact that they're a Jewish family living in the Deep South also has something to do with the events that are going to happen in the play because at this particular time and in Atlanta, Georgia, Jewish would have been a minority as well. Now, the other main character in the play is Hoke Colbert. Now, he's the driver that Bully hires for his mom. Now, when he the play begins, he's not exactly a young guy. He's 60 himself when the play starts. And he's um, black. He's been a member of the working class his whole life. He's uneducated, never gone to school, and he's always had these kinds of jobs working for other people. And he himself, again, is 85 by the ending of the play. So we're going to watch these people go through, again, 25 years at the end of their lives here. Now, most of the action in the play takes place in Atlanta, Georgia, and there's a small scene when they're driving and they go to take a trip towards Alabama. And this Deep South setting is really important because of the racial tensions that are going to come out of the course of the play. We have several minorities. Hoke is African American, Miss Daisy and Bully are Jewish, and you'll see Miss Daisy is not a really nice person for a lot of this play. She's very racist. She makes some rather unflattering generalization about blacks. At one point when she's convinced that Hoke has been stealing food out of the pan Entry, she makes this overarching comment that having black employees is, and here's the quote, like having little children in the house. If they want something, they just take it, not a smidgen of manners, no conscience. And she just makes these kinds of statements outright in front of people. So Miss Daisy's got a little bit of learning to do as this play goes on.
Now, we've mentioned a 25-year time span on the play. It begins in 1948 and goes up to 1973. So if you think about what you know from American history, that's a pretty important chunk of history for, um, for America. That's definitely the heart of the Civil Rights Movement. There were a lot of uh, political things that were happening during that time and a lot of social change that occurred during that time period. You're going from the 1950s up through the 60s and the protests and the hippies and all the way into the 70s before the play is over. Some of the themes to look for as you watch the movie is this idea that racism can be ended when people know each other on a personal level. And the play focuses on the way both Daisy and Hoke work together and end up changing each other because they do have this relationship. Hoke is going to learn some dignity and self-respect. Miss Daisy is going to acquire a little bit of wisdom to admit that she needs some help as she gets older. She has to be dependent on another person in her life. And the more Miss Daisy acknowledges that she needs Hoke to help her, um, the more hope comes to see that he really is important in the world and has something to offer. And each one is going to eventually, by the end of the play, accept each other as friends and as equals. Another theme is that what happens in the larger society can actually be mirrored in one-on-one -on -one relationships, that society's conflicts are reflected in the personal. Now, the lives of these characters take place in this community that's going to be deeply affected by the civil rights movement. And this movement has the impact on these individual lives and is going to change the way that they view each other. So you have this larger worldview and then the microcosm or the smaller world where these changes are playing out. By the end of the play, Miss Daisy is going to accept Hoke as a friend, and though even though the racial tensions in the macrocosm, that is the larger universe outside of Hoke and Daisy's world, are going to continue beyond 73, the play is going to end on this hopeful note that even if the country hasn't followed through on all of the promises of the civil rights movement, and of course we've been watching this week everything unfolding in Baltimore and everything over the last um, several months here in the country, we know that we're far from done with this idea of civil rights. But even so, even with the play ending in 73, we know that these particular two people have managed to create a human connection that can move beyond the barrier of race in society. So to summarize, we're talking about a piece of writing that was a very powerful piece of both theater and film, again being made into a motion picture in 1989. The film starred Jessica Tandy as Miss Daisy, Morgan Freeman, who you're going to love in this role as Hope, and Dan Aykroyd played um, Miss Daisy's son, Bully. Now, the play, again, only has three characters on the stage, but in the movie, there's don dozens of people. We see all of these other characters, including um, Hope's daughter, Idella the cook, and the movie kind of depicts realistically what's only imaginary on the stage. On the stage you just have two chairs and you kind of have to, the audience has to kind of imagine that these people are in a car driving because obviously it doesn't make a lot of sense trying to drive a car around a stage. But in the movie they're able to show the car's interior and the different locations and things. So you'll see some of those different locations and the additional characters in the film version. And that's the end. I look forward to studying this story with you, and you're going to have a chance to really get to know these characters and to do some writing in response to this as well.